Good evening, government fans. Today we're going to talk about the bureaucracy and uh, Congress's and the President's control over it. And yes, I know this sounds very fun and exciting, so you might want to hit pause, go to your microwave, make some popcorn, butter it up, and let's talk bureaucracy. Now, in all seriousness, um, several AP questions over the years have asked questions about the bureaucracy, and almost every question involves a component of how it is controlled. What control does Congress have over the bureaucracy? How does the president control it? And how do the courts control it? All right, as you see here, we have what is called the Iron Triangle. We have looked and every single AP exam has asked a question about the Iron Triangle. So you need to know it, you need to be familiar with it. The funny thing is, is this is pretty much extinct. Not quite a dinosaur, but getting there. Um, almost like a VHS player, if you still know what that is. All right? The Iron Triangle is a description of policy making in our government. All right? And policy making, oh, we don't want that up there. Hold on, ignore that for one second, unless you're in America at war. There we go. All right. Policy making. There you go. Sorry, we're not going to restart that. All right. So the Iron Triangle describes policy making and how our laws, our rules are made and how we implement these um, on a national scale. Okay. Now, as you can tell, there are three components to the Iron Triangle, thus the triangle term. This does not want to cooperate with me. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, in the Iron Triangle, we have three components, all right? Easiest way to remember this is the phrase Big C. Big C, okay? The bureaucracy. Every Iron Triangle has a bureaucratic agency that's a component to that, okay? That crosses off bureaucracy. Interest groups, which we have yet to learn about, all right, are also part of that. There's the IG from Big, okay? Um, in this particular example from a previous textbook, it includes all of the various veterans organizations that are part of the triangle. And then the C is Congress, all right, where we have the congressional committees that are working to pass the laws that are going to implement the policies. So making a long story short, how the Iron Triangle works, or worked, there's really only one left, and it's the one you see here. The Veterans Affairs Triangle still kind of exists as an Iron Triangle, okay? The interest groups... Okay, which could be Vietnam veterans, disabled veterans, VFW, et cetera, lobby for policy. They tell Congress what they want to have happen. So they're going to pressure Congress to pass a law in their benefit. All right? Congress is then going to pass the law that will help them. It might be more drug coverage for disabled veterans. It might be more veterans' benefits, uh, more veterans' hospitals, something like that. And then Congress, the committee, will work on the legislation, write the bill, pass it as a whole, and then send it over to the bureaucracy where you have the Department of Veterans Affairs, which will then implement the policy. Okay? So the group says what they want, Congress does it, bureaucracy enforces it, but the interest group is also telling the bureaucracy how they would like to see that implemented and, um, and passed in our government. Okay? So everything kind of works together in one big triangle. All right? Now what we have now is what's called an issue network. Okay, issue networks are a little more complex. All right, they are, include obviously your three components of the Iron Triangle. So you have your more World War II maps there for you. You have your bureaucracy. You have your interest groups. Okay, this is more mo new school. All right, how we do things today. All right, um, you have your bureaucracy. You have your interest groups. You have your congressional committee. All right, they all still work together, but there are more stakeholders, more people involved in an issue network. So an issue network describes the same thing an Iron Triangle does, just with more players and more components. All right? This will include members of the media. This will include what are called think tanks. All right? A think tank, all right, to make a long story short, is a university without students. It's a research institute. They do the research for the parties, for the different interest groups. All right? Some of them are groups in and of themselves. Um, and then they use that research to then guide future policy. Okay? Some famous ones are the American Enterprise Institute, very conservative. You have the Brookings Institute, which is very liberal. All right? And then there's a Cato Institute that's libertarian. That's one of many think tanks. But these are just some examples all right, of research institutions that help out the political parties and organizations. All right? Congressional staffers are also part of an issue network. Okay, 
And there's some controversy to this because these people are not elected. We elected our congressmen. We didn't elect the staffers, yet they know more than the actual congressmen do. So the staffers are able to do a lot of the legwork and things uh, for Congress. Okay, So issue networks just include more people, more institutions, but there's the same, uh, same things as the Iron Triangle, which is make policy. Okay. Now, the president has several checks on the bureaucracy, um, and they exist kind of within our checks and balances system. Okay? Um, first, you can see he can appoint and remove agency heads. All right? Um, that appointment power, that comes straight from the Constitution. A regulatory agency, which you should hopefully have already learned about today in class, if I was able to stay on task. I'm recording this Monday, so we may not have got there. You'll have to read about it. Um, but a regulatory agency, um, he cannot remove those because they are appointed by the president and then have a uh, term limit that is longer than the president, meaning that the president cannot remove them because they are at both Congress's and the president's discretion. Okay, um, So once they be you become an agency head, that person's in for a long time. The Federal Reserve, which is an regulatory agency has a 14-year term. <clears throat> so if Obama appoints a new Fed chair, that person could possibly be there for up to four different presidencies. All right? But any executive agency like the EPA, the FBI, he can hire and fire those people uh, at his discretion. He can also reorganize the bureaucracy with congressional approval. Okay? The largest reorganization we've ever seen of the bureaucracy happened after 9-11 with the Department of Homeland Security. All right, the president added um, a new department and consolidated a bunch of different agencies into one uh, group that way. Okay, uh, He can make changes in the budget. We're going to see that this week when President Obama unveils his budget. But if he wants an agency to get less money, they're going to be able to do less and have less power. And he can ignore these legislative initiatives. That's another check that he has. So if Congress is, say, or if, if um, the bureaucracy says to do something and carry out a policy, the president can ignore that and tell his enforcement agencies not to do that. Right? But the big check he has is appointment. That's your number one. If you know any of those, um, it falls there. Okay? He can also initiate or adjust policies that would alter the agency's activities right, with congressional approval. So you'll notice Congress kind of has the final say in a lot of bureaucratic things. Okay? If he wants to try a new policy out or um, adjust what they're going to do, he has to run that by Congress, and um, usually if a president has a lot of political capital, Congress will approve. All right? We've already learned a lot about the executive order. All right? This can only be to an agency. Keep that in mind. So a president tells an agency this is what you have to do, and it alters how a bill or a law is being enforced um, after it has been passed. Okay? And then he can reduce the budget, as we've seen there as well. All right, so several checks by the president, executive order, appointment, probably your top two. All right, moving along, Congress. All right, you saw that they have some checks on the president and the bureaucracy kind of hand in hand here. Um, passing legislation, it's a no-brainer, okay? Congress passes the law, they can give more or less power to an agency. All right, if they don't like what the EPA is doing, they just pass a new law that limits what power and funds that they have. All right. One thing you want to make sure you know of is constitutional checks that the bureaucracy, that Congress has, okay, and then more informal checks. Because there was one year on the exam where they asked about uh, constitutional checks that Congress has, and some of these students were putting in the test and they were not getting credit for because it wasn't in the Constitution. So make sure you read a question carefully. Constitution versus not. All right. Passing legislation, that's in the Constitution. That's a more formal check. All right. Congress can abolish programs. Uh, they can get rid of an agency if they want to. Okay. There used to be an ICC called the Interstate Commerce Commission that Congress outlawed because they were in charge of regulating railroad monopolies, and there weren't too many of those, so they sort of thought the agency outlived its usefulness. Okay. Uh, oversight. This is one that is not in the Constitution. But it is a power Congress has. They can um, <clears throat> compel a bureaucrat, in this case Timothy Geithner, or the Treasury Department, to testify and, during their investigations. This is what led to Clinton's impeachment also, was Congress was doing an investigation of the Justice Department, came across some of his uh, shady land dealings before we finally got to Monica Lewinsky. We'll talk more in class about that if you're interested. 
Um, but oversight is Congress just conducting a hearing, doing an investigation, and then if they don't like what they find, then they could impeach, they can pass legislation, and do other things along those lines. All right? Uh, Congress can influence the heads of the agency heads. All right? That's simply with the approval or denial of that. We are seeing that playing out right now. We have a uh, nominee for the head of the CIA, and Congress is not wanting, or Senate more specifically, is not wanting to approve that because of uh, potential things that he might have done regarding use of drones and torture and other things like that. Um, so Congress has to approve um, any agency heads, that being the Senate there. All right? And then Congress can write legislation which limits the bureaucracy's discretion. They can limit what power they have or give them more power should they want that agency to be able to do more. Okay? Um, there's something we're going to talk about in class on Wednesday regarding the Canadian National Railway. All right? You might see their trains coming through Mundelein a little more frequently than before, and that all comes right out of the bureaucracy. The, um, one of the bureaucratic agencies had to approve of that railroad merger, and when that happened, that put a lot more train traffic in your backyard. The judicial branch, same thing. Their checks are pretty obvious. They can rule on whether the bureaucrats have acted within the law. All right, we call that judicial review. And they can rule on the constitutionality of all rules and regulations. So if Congress issues a, um, or if the bureaucracy issues a ruling, that rule could very well be deemed unconstitutional um, in the event uh, it violates any rights found in the Constitution. And Congress can issue injunctions. I'm sorry, the Supreme Court can issue injunctions, or any court can, to require uh, an agency to do something. That's what an injunction is, is they uh, put a stop on an activity that an agency is doing until they can rule on the constitutionality of it. So if the EPA comes out tomorrow and says all lawnmowers are banned um, in the United States and they're going to fine anybody that cuts their lawn, that wouldn't happen. That's a bad example I have to think of on my feet here. Um, then the Supreme Court can issue an injunction, say, sorry, you can't take away those lawnmowers until we rule on the law. So they've limited the EPA's power to take away your lawnmower until that rule is determined constitutional or not. Okay? Um, also, you'll see here about whistleblowers. Okay, this is also a check. Now, this isn't coming from the three branches, but these are people within the agency themselves. Okay? A whistleblower, you don't have to write this example down. It's kind of an outdated example. But a whistleblower is somebody in the bureaucracy that tells the media, tells Congress, tells the president of some illegal or unethical activity that's going on. And when that whistleblower um, sort of sheds some light on that, then they, um, that usually leads to an investigation and possibly a firing of an agency head or something like that, or at least some laws to change what they're, what they're doing. Okay, um, Time Magazine actually about four or five years ago voted whistleblowers as the quote man of the year or person of the year because of uh, some stories that got uh, blown out of, or <clears throat> uncovered in the, in the um, media. All right, there's a Whistleblower Protection Act of 1989. All right, which uh, basically protects a whistleblower um, if they are uh, disciplined for revealing any information, leaking any information about the agency. And um, the government or Supreme Court ruled in 06 that that law was unconstitutional because it said you do not have First Amendment rights. So if you work for the FBI, you don't have the right to free speech to talk about what the FBI is doing and making a long story short. Okay, So um, whistleblowing, while it is a check, they do not have the same protection. So more than likely, if you're going to be a whistleblower, count on losing your job because you will be fired by the agency and you don't have First Amendment protections. Um, but all the famous whistleblowers we've talked about have um, lost their, or left their jobs before they leaked the story. All right. Um, here's a question from an AP exam here for you. Go ahead and pause it as you read. The role Congress plays in ensuring that executive agencies are carrying out their legislative responsibilities All right, is known as there we go, it's World War II again. All right, legislative oversight. All right, so Congress makes sure that they're carrying out their responsibilities, doing what they're assigned, and if they don't like that, leads to impeachment or redoing of laws or auditing of funding or something like that. Okay? When independent regulatory agencies make the rules, enforce these rules, and adjudicate their disputes or judge the disputes arising under those, they risk violating the constitutional concept of. And here's our correct answer. 
Lost it again. I'm going to just close that next time I do this. Separation of powers. Okay? Because these regulatory agencies have quasi legislative powers to make rules, they have executive power to enforce them, and they have quasi judicial powers to adjudicate them. All right? Examples of regulatory agencies are the FCC, the Fed, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which regulates the stock market. Okay, uh, and a few others. All right, uh, we'll have another a video on those tomorrow. All right, and that concludes our lecture on the checks and balances of the bureaucracy. All right, almost any question you're going to be asked is going to have you identify some checks that Congress, the courts, and the executive have on the bureaucracy. All right, have a good day. We'll talk to you in class tomorrow.